morning again. Morning. Thank you. This morning we are reading from Psalm 84. I feel like I'm not reading the real Bible when I read from the cell phone. <laughs> well, where is your Bible then? <laughs> Just asking. Someone took it accidentally. Accidentally. Did not steal it. You don't steal in the church. You took it. <laughs> Hope it will enrich that person, that Bible. <laughs> Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her, her young, a place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk is, whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, God, that we can be here in this place today. Thank you, God, that this is our happy place. A place, Lord God, when we as we encounter you and we encounter each other, both those sitting here today in the chairs, in community, as well as those who are watching us from wherever they are throughout the world. Thank you, Lord God, for the beauty of the church. And thank you, Lord God, that we can be part of it. In Jesus' name, we pray this prayer. Amen. Morning, everyone. If I can welcome you um, and welcome all those who are watching us, wherever you may be, uh, online, wherever it is that you are, welcome to you. It's great to have you with us here today, um, especially those who are visiting us for the first time. It's, it's good to have you with us. So uh, we got, we're starting off with a bit of a pop quiz if you're ready for it, you're ready for a pop quiz. Okay, there's a prize. Uh, actually, there's two prizes. Uh, so there's gonna, Greg's going to jam a song for us in a moment. Uh, you ready, Greg? I'm ready. Okay, good. So one prize for guessing the artist and second prize for guessing the song or the name of the song. Is that okay? Good job. The prize is um, you get to have your offering back again. <laughs> Sorry for those who put nothing in. <laughs> that five bucks that you put in the offering basket, you're getting it back. <laughs> okay. Um, Greg, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. So, when you, so, Greg, finish. Just finish it. No matter, even if the crowd is going crazy because they're going to go crazy, just finish it as it goes. Don't worry about them shouting and screaming and waving and switching on their cell phone lights and all the rest of it uh, as, you, as you sing for it. I mean, not going to sing. He's going to play the song. Um, so when you know it, um, then shout out either the artist or the, or the group and then and also the song. Okay, you ready? Yes. No, not you. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, good job. Greg, over to you. Awesome, Greg. Well done. That was good, man. Well done. Okay, so the artist, the group is? The Eagles. The song is? 
Okay. <laughs> well done. That, that reveals two things about you. <laughs> Are you ready for it? Number one, you're old. <laughs> Number two, you took drugs sometimes. <laughs> Because as much as I love that song, and I do love that song, and I'm going to download it again just because I remember it now, uh, because uh, I love the last line uh, of that song. Um, it goes like this. You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. You can check out of Hotel California any time, but you can never leave. Now, that's a great theme song for my, uh, for my message today. I'm going to be speaking about my happy place, and I'm going to be speaking about church. Uh, and the temple of God, and, and David, um, the psalmist that wrote that, uh, that song, uh, was speaking about the, the temple of God. Uh, and I love the thought that you, can, that you can check out if you want to, but you will never leave. But unfortunately, that song is about drugs. And, um, uh, and really, the, uh, the artist was actually speaking about the fact that you can check out, but you can never leave when you're addicted. But of course, we know that's not true if you know Jesus Christ, am I right? And we've got a couple of our guys from the Dudley and his team from the recovery course that will testify to the fact that uh, with the power of God, you can check out and you can leave. Am I right, Dudley? All right, exactly. It is Dudley, hey? It is you, Dudley, am I right? It is you, because you're sitting very quietly there today. <laughs> Picking on him. You can... You can check out, but you can never leave. Uh, I love this, this um, psalm as David writes it. And just to give you a bit of context of, of David writing the psalm, is that David was in exile. So this is King David, the same guy that killed Goliath. This is the same guy, right? He's in exile. In other words, he's been, he's been kicked out the country. In other words, he actually had to run away, actually, because his son Absalom right, was out to kill him. I don't know about you. But I've had grief for my kids in my life. Trust me. But I've never had to run away to Botswana to escape their wrath and to go into exile. But David had to. David had to literally flee for his life because his son wanted to kill him. There was deep division in the land at the time. And so he's in exile far away. And he's reminiscing about Jerusalem and about so many things about his life. And that's what happens when you're in exile. And the thing about in exile is that often when you go into exile, you can be in a place that's, um, you, you can be a king in the one country, but you go into exile and you're a nothing. You can live in a palace in the one moment in your hometown, but when you go into exile, you can end up living in a, out of a cave and be completely homeless. And so, yeah, King David has everything stripped away from him, everything, living in exile. But the one thing he remembers is the temple, the house of God. The one thing he remembers is the court of the Lord. And so he writes the psalm and he remembers what it was like to worship God in God's house. Uh, and he says a whole lot of amazing things that I'm going to speak about in a moment. In fact, there's four like, specific words that I'll pick up uh, as David writes this, the psalm. Okay, so you ready to follow? You good? Okay, let me speak firstly about his delight. I mean, do you notice there was such incredible delight for David in, in writing the psalm? You can almost sense his joy. Now, and there's a thing about us when we come to church... There's nothing better than watching people with a huge sense of delight as they arrive for church. Now, one thing that has changed from the Hotel California people amongst us is that you probably grew up in a time where you were just expected to go to church. It was your duty to go to church. In fact, you would, um, uh, there was a lot of stuff about belonging to a church. I mean, my father, I'll never forget, on his first CV and application form, he wrote down the fact that he was a committed a member of the Methodist Church. And he knew on his CV that that would put him in good standing for the company that was going to employ him, no matter where it was. I don't know how many of you, when you've looked for a job, put on the fact that you belong to Grace Point. 
or even that you're a committed Christian. You know, but for, because that could count against you now. But, but um, you know, in, in that time, um, being a member of a church and going to church was the done thing. Remember the time of no sport on Sundays, no shops open on Sundays, all of that. So maybe some people, we went to church because there's nothing else to do on a Sunday morning. I don't know. But there is something different in my view now. Because people now who come to church, there's a sense most of the time of delight. And I can sense it when we worship, and specifically in this church, I can sense it when we're worshiping together and, and we're connecting with each other. There's just this amazing thing a sense of delight. I don't know if you read recently, um, uh, sorry, and not, and not feeling that you have to come. And I'm not saying discipline when it comes to churches is not, a, it's, it's, you know, I'm not saying it's, not, it's a good thing because we, we come to church even, even if we're not feeling in the best place. But generally speaking, there's a sense of delight. And also, have you also noticed that when we worship God, when we give ourselves in worship to God, even, though, even if we've come here carrying stuff and things are really difficult for us, have you also sensed that there's a, you know, there's a, a tr- sense of transformation happens that can, can turn distress into delight? Have any of you experienced that? Some of you have. Good. But I was reading about this kid, um, a kid called Preston. He was seven years old. Now, something about, I don't know what it is. There's something about being called Preston. I hope there's not... A Preston, yeah, I'm running into trouble. There's some kind of Preston that sounds naughty. Uh, am I right? So, so Preston, seven years old, it happened a little while ago, steals his old man's car. Okay, how about for a time, bit of truth. How many of you, when you grew up, stole your mom or dad's car? Raise your hands. I'm just illustrating what you must do. I'm not saying I did it. My word. Now, for the rest of you who haven't and who have not got their license yet, let this be a lesson. Do not steal your parents' car at any time. So Preston, seven years old, gets in his dad's car and goes for a drive. So the police obviously spot the seven-year-old driving the car and they freak out. But the kid's going like 80, 90, 100 kilometers an hour through the suburbs. And so the the cops get a bit nervous now. They don't want to go and um, pull him off, or so they just basically follow him at a safe place, at a safe from a safe distance. The kid Preston sees, according to the report, sees the cops, and what does he decide to do? Because now all of a sudden he's not so brave anymore. You know, you know what I'm saying? And and he sees the cops. So what does he do? He goes home, and so he quickly pulls into his um, driveway of his parents' home. And he gets out of the car and runs inside the house away from the police. So the police knock on the door, according to the report, and they sit, Preston and the father, and they're going, listen here, why did you steal your dad's car? And he said, no, I stole the car and drove it away because I didn't want to go to church today. That was his literal, genuine excuse. He was so terrified of going to church that he stole his father's car to try and drive away. It was almost like, and I can say this, so excuse me just for a moment, because this is, a, this is probably something that Preston would say. His dad, mom and dad woke him and said, hey, Preston, it's time to go to church now. And he looked up at them and said, that's a hell no. Am I right? I am not going to church. That's a hell no. I'm, there's no ways I'm going to steal my father's car before I go to church. But for us in that, there's a sense in which when David writes this, is, there's a sense of delight, a sense of joy. Now, I don't know why it is that you love the church, but there's got to be a reason why you love the church. There has to be a reason why you are here today. Because there is, whether you're here or whether you're watching online, there's a reason why you want to be part of it. And that is manifested in, in the fact that you're here today and how you worship. And Because you can't come to church grudgingly. You know, you can't, you, you, to, it's just the worst possible place to be if you get here and you just don't want to be here. And so there's a sense of, of delight as David writes this. Let me tell you something about, uh, about uh, when, you, when you get delight or joy out of church. You're present and you're pleasant. You're present and you're pleasant. 
present and pleasant, mean you're in it. You're here. You're invested in it. You're present because there's something about coming into the presence of God that brings about a place of, of joy and gratitude and a desire to honor God. So do you love this church? Okay, this side was very quiet. Very strong here. Do you guys love this church? Good job. Okay. All those online, do you love this? Oh, we can't hear you. Okay. <laughs> but but it's, it is a sense of there's a reason why you love it. And it's not just, it's not just, it's not about grace point. It's about the temple of God. It's about a sense of being here. I, I, love, I always tell the story of, of this, um, the couple that I saw parking their car, so, but I'm making a point of it this time. I've shared it before. And uh, they were boxing with each other, not physically, but they were really giving each other a go in the car. You could see it. You can see when people are fighting, am I right? And the two of them are, man, it's hands and the mouths are going, whatever. Uh, and they get out the car and they sort of compose themselves a bit. By the time they came walking down, they sort of, they weren't strangling each other at this stage. But the minute they saw me in the foyer, it was like they were on honeymoon, I'm telling you. <laughs> they couldn't let each other go, smiling and sweetie and darling uh, uh, and all the rest of it. <laughs> it was so funny. They didn't know us, watched them the whole way. But this is the thing. When they came to church, all right, and they saw the pastor, they knew there was a sense that, now I'm not saying fake it, but there is something that happens when we come in here, no matter how hard our week has been, when we come in here and we recognize that this is God's house, something does change in us, if we're able to see that and recognize that this is God's house. It brings out a sense of delight. And secondly, I love the way there was a strong place, sense of desire when it came to David when he wrote this. He, he says this, he says that his entire being longed to be at the house. So here he is in exile in a cave somewhere. It says his soul, his body, his heart longed to be in the place of worship. He, it was actually physically manifest. Have you ever, have you ever met, missed someone so much? that your body actually aches. Has, has that ever happened to you? It's like when you're thinking about someone, and maybe they're far away, maybe they're here, maybe you've lost them through, through death, maybe, and, and, you, and, you, and you say, I, I physically ache because I'm missing someone. Has that ever happened to you? And, and yeah, David is saying, my whole body my, my whole being. I mean, I love that even in the song, and it's in a different version when we sang the, the version of the psalm in that song. He actually says, my heart and soul faints. I mean, literally faints with a desire to be with God and to be in the temple of God. I mean, whatever thoughts occupied his mind at that time, whatever it was that he was thinking about the house of God, his pulse quickened, his heart beat, started beating faster, his eyes got bigger and brighter. I can imagine him sitting there and just having a deep sense of this desire. He writes about it somewhere else, by the way, in Psalm 27. He says, one thing have I desired of the Lord, one thing that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And then again in Chronicles, moreover, because I have set my affection to the house of God. Because you see, ultimately, the desires of our heart reveal the conditions of our soul. The desires of our heart reveal the condition of our soul. What you and I long for in life reveals what you love and it reveals who you are. I'm going to say that again. What you long for in life reveals what you love and what you love reveals who you are. And so there was this desire 
to meet with God. There was a desire so much so that it manifested itself physically for him. I love it when I hear of people who have gone away for a season and uh, who come back and say, oh, Gary, we really missed coming to Grace Point. Or I, hear, I, was, in, um, I was in Freiburg yesterday. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, Friday night I was actually in Clarkstorp and um, I, I was chatting to this, this guy. He drives from Clarkstorp here. He might even be here. Uh, one of the leaders in, in the churches, and he said uh, he comes and worships here once a month when he visits his family here. And he spoke about this desire of what it was like to be part of this worshiping community, even though it only comes once a month. But I loved watching him. I, uh, I I'll, I'll often speak to people uh, on our membership course and ask them how they ended up at Grace Point. And, and I'll never forget the one day um, this person said to me, um, on Monday mornings, there was a person who worked with them who worshipped at Grace Point who'd come in on a Monday morning. And you know what it's like on Monday mornings at work? Hey, so how was your weekend? Am I right? Like a lot of people going, how was your weekend? What did you do this weekend? And so for some of the guys, it's, hey, it was so lucky. I got drunk and I fell down and I was, I was like a sloshed and uh, went to all these parties and it was kiff, you know, and all the rest of it. And, uh, and people say, well, I was away for the weekend and I done, did this, whatever the case may be. But this guy, every Monday morning, would come in and he would speak about church. So when people asked him, how was your weekend? What did you do? He goes, man, I went to church yesterday. And let me tell you something. It was like, and uh, you know, so he would speak about the worship or about the sermon. Or, and then he would actually tell the guy something, maybe a little point about the sermon. When I found out afterwards, when I spoke to this guy, he said to me, Gary, what I would do is this, is that whoever preached on Sunday... I would like take out one point that would be relevant for someone at work if they asked me, what did I do this weekend? I mean, how's that? He would just take one thing that would be um, relevant to a person who doesn't come to church. That, 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 that maybe they could tie the dots. Tie the dots, you know what I mean? Join the dots, sorry, join the dots. They could join the dots. <laughs> the dots. They could join the dots. And so when they asked me um, how was church, I would say, oh, and by the way, what do you think about this? And then would share that with that person. Not, not you know, Bible bashing, but just share. And then the, the person would go, oh, man, would make a link between normal life and church, that there actually is this connection. But back to the new member. What he said to me, though, he said that, Gary, when, this, when he spoke about church, something happened to him. Um, and so, you know, we are, t- we are told, for those here today who are Christ followers, that we are told, you know, to make disciples, it is our job to witness. Now, I don't know about you, but just, just telling someone about Jesus isn't easy when you're standing um, in the line at the bank and tap someone on the shoulder and tell them Jesus loves them or something. Not that easy. But when someone asks you, how was your weekend? What a great opportunity to witness. It's like an open door in a way. And this guy just got creative about it. But the person then who ended up giving his life to Jesus and being part of this church said, something happened in this guy when he spoke about church. And I ultimately wanted to be part of that. I ultimately wanted to be part about this desire. Thirdly, I love the the devotion that David had. He he, he was so devoted. Um, And as David thought about God's house and about how far away from it he was, he began to reflect on certain parts of it. Now, have you ever gone away somewhere, okay, say on a holiday or on a trip or something, and then you you recount some of the stuff that you did while you're away? You know, you remember some of the stuff and you retell the story of the time that you were away. And then after a while in that, you'll, you'll look at the big picture stuff, like the big things, but then after a while, you start remembering the little things that at first were seemingly insignificant, but then after a while, even those small things become so unbelievably significant. And so David, of all the things he speaks about in the temple, he speaks about two birds. I mean, I couldn't understand that. He speaks about a sparrow, 
and he speaks about a swallow. Now, quite frankly, those are very low on the bird thing, rung, for want of a better word. I mean, he could have spoken about eagles and hawks and owls and other stuff. But he speaks about two really insignificant, dime a dozen birds. But yet there's something about them that, that touches David's soul. And I wonder about that, you know. A worthless sparrow and a wandering swallow who make a nest in the temple of God. And I realize this. That part of the beauty of the church, and specifically this church, is that we will always make sure for those who the world feels is worthless, here you will feel worthy in this place. No matter how rejected, no matter how people look out at, down on you, no matter how people may judge you, out there, here, you will always have worth. No matter how the world may judge you, because you may have or may have not, or because of things you've done or the way you've lived your life, here, you will have a sense of your worth. Because we as a church literally exist for those who don't belong here. For those who aren't part of it. So in other words, we exist to make sure that those out there feel at home here. We don't exist for ourselves. The, the whole idea, friends, every Sunday is not for me to you know, light a fire and for you and I to sit around the fire and sing Kumbaya, my Lord, and be all happy and comfortable with each other. Everything that we do, everything that we do, we do for those who are not members here and who do not worship here. So that we can go out and bring people in. We exist for the unchurched. We exist for the non-members. The only organization that exists for its non-members. Because somehow you and I have seen the light. We've crossed the line of faith. But our work is to go out and say to those who the world says you are worthless, we say to them in God's eyes you are worthy. And so the, the sparrow who is worthless in the, in the, in the chain of, of birds feels so at home in the temple of God that it ends up making a nest, saying, I'm going to call this home. And, and so David, in this moment of his devotion to God and his devotion to the temple, meant that he was devoted even to those who aren't part of the temple. I love the, the way he speaks about the swallow. Now, uh, the swallow, as we, as we said, are, are, are wanderers. You know, come, go, come, go. David messed up in his life, as we all do. And you see, the thing is about, uh, being, uh, about being a church that judges sinners, you know, when, when the church becomes so self-righteous that points its finger at everyone else and, and judges other people for the way they live or things that they've done, wait for the moment where you mess up big time. Because there by the grace of God goes I. To a place in that where you are rejected and scorned by everyone. And then you find out what it's like to come back to this place and be amongst people who show God's grace and God's mercy for you. One of the most exciting, I, I mean, I love it when I hear people say, I never ever went to church, but I came here to this place and I felt welcome and I felt that I could make a nest here. And now from never, ever, ever, ever growing up in the church to this being their first church that they've ever belonged to is amazing. I love that. That should be our story. But to be honest with you, when I hear about people who at one time were close to God 
And sometimes this makes it even more difficult. Who at one stage were close to God. And either they messed up or something went wrong in their life and they left the church. Sometimes for years. Or people who were hurt by the church or hurt by someone in the church. Almost for them, it's even more difficult to come back like a swallow. So when I hear your story of how you were hurt or rejected or judged, but somehow you have found your way back, oh, my heart just, I can't tell you what it does. Because you've come back and you found that you as, as a wandering swallow can come back. And you can make your home here again. And so David had this devotion for the temple because it was a place for those who would not normally belong. Or it was a place for people to come back to, to return to and make a home. Okay, lastly, it was a place of duty for David. It was a place of duty. He says two very interesting things, okay? He says this, first he says, better is one day in your court than a thousand others. You remember that part, we sang it. Better is one day in your court than a thousand others. And the second thing he says, I would rather be a doorkeeper. In other words, you'd rather be part of the welcome team. Can we give the welcome team a shout out? Yeah. You guys are, you guys are amazing when you come here on Sunday mornings and we see your smiling faces. Uh, it's, it's incredible. Uh, to see. Thank you for saving us from some of the church greeters that we have come across that when they see you in the parking lot, their arms are already open and they rush to greet you. They don't know you from Adam, but you make us feel welcome here and we're grateful for that. I'd rather be a doorkeeper, I'd rather be an usher, I'd rather be a welcomer than, go to, than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Now, let me tell you two things about that. One is, this is, a, this is the king we're talking about. But there's something about the church that I love is that the, whether you are a, a multimillionaire or whether you have absolutely nothing, the ground at the cross is very level. Now, one thing that I remember growing up in a, in a, in a church, in a traditional church uh, like this one, is that you'd have a communion rail. Some of you remember that. And you'd have cushions uh, at the communion rail, and you'd come forward for communion and kneel, and then you'd receive communion. Do some of you remember that growing up? In, and some churches, obviously, you still do it. But what I loved about that image, what I loved about that image is that whether you were rich or poor, whether you were black or white, whether you were young or old, when you knelt, we were all exactly the same anyway. And David, King David, is saying, no job is below me, even as the king. I would rather be a doorkeeper than dwell in the house um, of, of evil. Amazing. Better is one day in your courts than anywhere else. Now, let me tell you something. King David had access to everything. He was like a VIP member no matter where he went. He never had to stand in a line. He never had to do it. He was welcomed anywhere he went. And what does he say? He said, man, I'd rather spend a day here than anywhere else. But it was about duty. At the end of the day, you see, that this is the thing, friends. And this is where a bit of a challenge comes in for you today. You can have the desire, I said, the delight, the desire, the devotion you can come to church as happy as anything, as joyful as anything, and get out as much as you want to get out of the church. You can be devoted, you can be all the rest of it. But if that does not equate to duty, to a sense that I need to serve, to be, to, to, for me to take my rightful place in the temple, means I need to have a duty somewhere. And this is where my heart breaks so much. What David's saying, I'd rather spend a day in the court than a thousand elsewhere. Is, is that so many of you here today who, who call this home, you are so incredibly gifted and talented. And, and it breaks my heart that the world gets the best of you. The best of your talents. The best of your gifts. It breaks my heart. 
And I'm not even saying your duty should be in whatever you do. I'm not saying if you're an accountant, you should serve in our finance team. But in some ways, the kingdom is being robbed. And yet it is God is the one who's literally giving you the gifts to do what you do. God is the one. You can do what you do because of God. And at some stage we're called to be dutiful. At some stage we're called to be dutiful to the temple and to God and to serve God. So let me wrap up. This for me, um, you know, here at Grace Point or the church in general, is my happy place. It really is my happy place. Because I know that, uh, and so some of you may have a happy place. I don't know where your happy place is. But my, one of my happy places is right here in the church. I love coming here because I love the sense of fellowship. Uh, I love the support. I love the care. I love people. I love seeing people. Uh, I love the word. There's so much about it that this makes this my happy place. But most of all, it, it's my happy place because I know somehow that, that God is here. Now, I know God is everywhere. I get that. I know that God can be anywhere and is everywhere. But, like this woman came, I, I was late, working late the one night and this, I was leaving, this lady arrived in her car and uh, she says, guys, where are you going? She says, you're going up to the prayer room. She wants to pray because something had happened and she was praying for healing for someone. And so she, um, and, I, and I said to her, I said, but you could pray anywhere. She said, I know, but there's something about being up in the prayer room. And she was on her way up to the prayer room. There's something about being in the prayer room that I just had a sense of God being there. Uh, when, she, when she came a little while before, when this thing started, she, she actually got to the prayer room and it was locked. How welcoming is that? <laughs> Sorry. Um, and so she came into the church, yeah. And it was late at night and it was pitch dark. And first she said she felt a bit scared, you know. And then she came and sat down on one of the chairs close to midnight. And in the darkness, was overcome by God's presence. Overcome by God's presence. And she could have prayed anywhere. But this was her happy place. My prayer then for you and for me is that our church... For you, it's this season, it's this church. For those who are watching online, it could be anywhere else. That you would really find joy and peace and love and acceptance in your happy place. That hopefully is this church. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we are grateful for you. For who you are in our lives. We are grateful for this church. And all the churches across the world that we're meeting today. We thank you, Lord God, for many people. They will find refuge and strength in those places. And indeed, Father God, that you would be there. No matter where they are. No matter where they worship. No matter where they call home. No matter where is their happy place. Thank you, God, that we can meet together here. Thank you that we can be united as the body of Christ. Thank you, God, that we have a place to call home, our happy place, because you are here. In Jesus' name, amen.